you say when you come into the church, you you just feel a tremendous sense of encouragement. There's something happening. But you know what? You you guys are that encouragement. You are that uh, thing that just brings the atmosphere of the presence of Jesus because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He, he, he indwells us. He indwells you. He, and, and, you know, this morning as, as we look at communion, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to share this morning as, as we go through this is that, you know, communion, if you break down the word, it's come union. And union has to do with being together, being knit together uh, with. And and who are we knit together with? Well, obviously we're knit together with Christ. There's a communion with him, but there's also a communion within the, his body. And that's what's so neat. It's, it's neat to hear the testimonies of, this is what, you know, whether it be a son who calls you up and encourages you, or you call up a son, or, or, or uh, you know, whatever it is, there's an encouragement when we are united together. And so as we, as we look at communion this morning, I, I just want to kind of keep that backdrop in front of us. Uh, I, actually, I actually have that thought in, in the notes that I prepared for today. So let's pray. Lord, as we look at your word and as we think about communion this morning, as we partake of communion, I pray that you would indeed knit our hearts together as one in you. Knit our hearts together with, with each other, but also, Lord, draw us even closer to you that we would be united as one with you. And we would do exploits for you, for the kingdom of God, because of who you are and because of how we uh, just grow together in you and we, we respond to you in all that we do. Amen. Communion. Familiar, familiar passage, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that we often look at when we think about communion. Uh, Jesus, when he had given thanks, he broke the bread, and he said, uh, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Why do we observe communion? Well, you know, we're probably, we've probably asked that question many times. We probably have many answers, and, and probably uh, most of the answers are, are correct and good. We observe communion because, number one, he told us to. In that verse I just read, uh, 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 in verse 24, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, are you a follower of Jesus? Then, if you're a follower of Jesus, you do what he tells you to do. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do it out of simple obedience, number one. We also observe communion uh, because it's a way of remembering Christ and all that he's done for us in, in life, in his death, and in his resurrection. When he had broke the bread, and he, and he said, you know, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. What are we remembering? We're remembering Christ's life. He was talking to his disciples. They had been walking with him for close to three years. Uh, they had been in fellowship with him. They had seen him doing th miracles. They had, uh, they had just spent time with him. And he said, do it in remembrance of me. Uh, we remember 
we remember people for certain things. Uh, we just just recently we had a discussion with with my with our children. We were discussing, uh, you know, about end of life planning. And we said, you know, is it important to have a place of remembrance for us when we die? I <laughs> uh, hadn't thought about bringing that in here, but I thought well, it ties into remembrance because recently my wife and I were in southern Pennsylvania where, where my parents are buried and where her parents are buried. And we just kind of on the spur of the moment, we went and visited their grave site. It wasn't like we were worshiping their grave site, but it was a place of remembrance. We were remembering our parents. We certainly don't just remember them when we go to visit the grave site, but Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus lived a life that was worth remembering. Jesus performed miracles that are worth remembering. And we're grateful that they're written down in the word of God, and many of them, and I'm sure not nearly all of them are written down, but they're, they are there for us to remember. And today we partake of communion together in remembrance of him and all he's done. It was appropriate for us to have testimonies this morning in remembrance of what God has been doing in our lives. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28, he says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus wants us to remember his great love for us, that he gave his life. He shed his blood for us. Recently, I was reading a, a book that had was talking about was, was the death of Christ on the cross, was, a, was that an act of God's anger or was it an act of God's love? And sometimes it's portrayed as, a, as a, an act of anger that God was so angry at sin that he had to take it out on someone, and he took it out on Jesus. I don't believe that. I believe it was instead, instead an act of God's great love for us, that God said, I, I, I want these people to come into relationship with me, so much so that I'm willing to give my son on the cross. Man killed Jesus. God didn't kill him. It was man's wrath that killed Jesus, not God's wrath. But we do we we look back to his death and and, and his resurrection and, and we remember his work for us, what he did for us. When observing communion uh, we also take time to examine ourselves. Jesus said a man ought to, uh, actually it was Paul said, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So when we come to partake of communion, uh, come into fellowship with Jesus, we're supposed to examine ourselves and say, is there anything in my life that, that hinders my relationship with Jesus? Uh, is, there, is there anything there that I need to get straightened out? And if we're honest, most of us will say, yeah, there's probably some things we need to, we need to, we need to come and repent and say, forgive me, I was, I was insensitive in that. And, and we need to discern the body of Christ. Discerning the body of Christ, I believe, means understanding who he is, but also understanding his body and honoring his body together. In observing communion, we proclaim his death until he comes. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. So 
by proclaiming his death until he comes, it's, it's actually a statement of faith. When we partake of communion together, we, we declare Christ died for me, he shed his blood for me, and he loves me, he loves you also. We proclaim his death. It's a statement of faith uh, that we proclaim when we take part in communion. When we observe communion, we also show our participation in the body of Christ. His life becomes our life, and we become members of one another. Uh, he said, unless you eat this bread and drink this cup, uh, we, it's, it's, we, we need to bring him into us, Christ in us. And, and I know, you know, we eat the bread and we drink the cup, and, the, and we do not believe that that's literally, uh, although some do believe that it's literally transubstantiated, I believe is the word. Uh, it literally becomes a body. I don't believe that, but I, I do believe that it is a representation of his, his body. It's a representation of his blood. And we, we partake of it with the understanding and with the sense that, that we are receiving him into us. And when we eat the bread, it, it becomes part of us. When we drink the cup, it becomes a part of us. We don't take it in and somehow it just floats around in there. It's kind of a, it's, its own thing, but it's be, it becomes a part of us. And, and that's the way our, our relationship with Christ is also. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us changes our life. Our life is never the same when Christ comes into our life. He changes us for, for now and for eternity. So it's, uh, it's, a, a, it's a participation, it's a recognition of, you know, Jesus died on the cross so that I could come into a relationship and, and, and I now am, am a part of him and he's a part of me and, and somehow we're, we're totally uh, changed in that process. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. We all come from the same loaf. And we... Uh, represent his body. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 53. That was a hard saying. And according to Scripture, when, when Jesus said that, there were some who said, wait a minute. Uh, uh, that's, that's too hard to say. We, as a body of Christ, need to understand that, that he needs to become such an integral part of us that there is no separation, that, it, that we become one with him. It, baptism, when we have a baptism, it is a baptism into the death of Christ and a resurrection into new life with Christ. And so baptism is a representation of of that exchange taking place in our life. And so uh, we observe communion to show that relationship, that participation in his body. Communion sometimes is, we, we say, it's a sacrament. A sacrament. Uh, it's a, a sacrament simply means it's, it's a... Uh, it's a religious observance, a religious act uh, that's sacred as a sign or a symbol of a spiritual reality. And in a, in a real way, when we partake of communion, it is a sacrament. But I want to propose to you that it is much more than a sacrament. It's, it goes beyond that. It is all, communion is also a fellowship. Communion is... is 
coming together in, in, in uh, union and being joined together, uh, becoming one with. Uh, it, uh, I suggested earlier, if you break down the word communion, it is union with, come union. Jesus ate with his disciples the Last Supper where they shared the bread and the wine together. Uh, picture that, if you would. Jesus there around the table, with, at the table, or uh, with, with his disciples sharing uh, in a meal. It was a time of fellowship together. Uh, it was a time, I don't think they sat around silently at that table. I think they were talking among themselves and, and sharing with each other and encouraging one another and maybe challenging each other. But it was a time of fellowship that they, that they had. Uh, so it was not just a special time with Jesus, but it was a special time with with each, all, all the other disciples also. Father God desires that we come and commune with him. And in his great love, he has made a way for us to be united with him through the broken body and the shed blood on the cross of Calvary. We are in need of a Savior. He is our Savior. <clears throat> and when we are in union with him as our Savior, then we can have communion with him. When, when we receive Jesus as our Savior, he opens the door for us to have that fellowship with him. Today, if you're here and you say, I don't know what that's all about. I've, I've never received Jesus as my Savior. This could be the day that you could do that. He stands at the door to welcome us into, his, into that fellowship with him. He says, come and, and, and dine. Come and, be a, come and have fellowship with Come and commune with me. Today is the day that you can receive him as your personal Savior and, and enter into that relationship. And if you've never done that, I challenge you, this is the day for you. Jesus invites you to come. Jesus says, come and, and walk with me. Now, when I, think of, when I think of the disciples, when Jesus instituted communion and, and he told them, do this in remembrance of me, I... I can imagine the disciples remembering, remembering the things that, that they did, how they walked with Jesus down the, along the dusty roads. I can imagine that they remembered the times they just sat around and talked with Jesus, had a chat with him. I can remember I can imagine they remembered the times that they laughed together. Uh, probably sometimes that they maybe cried together. See, that's all part of having communion, having a relationship, an intimate relationship with Jesus. And so today, as we partake of communion in a few minutes, I want to suggest to you that communion is it goes beyond this act of eating bread and drinking the cup together. Uh, communion, Christ desires to have communion with us on a day-by-day -day basis, every day. Not just once a day, but throughout the day. He wants to walk with us. He wants to commune with us throughout our life. Some of that takes place as we, as we spend time in his word. When you get into, into God's Word and you read His Word and, and, and you begin to understand and you begin to get, well, this is what the Father's heart is. That's part of communion. Meditating on His Word. Praying. Praying. You know, and, and, and praying is not always just praying, give me this, but it's also praying God's heart. There's power when we pray God's heart. When, when we know that this is what God desires to see happen 
in, in this situation and we pray his heart, there's power in that. And that's part of communion with him on a daily basis. Communion with him is to live a life of gratitude for what he's done in our life. Communion with Christ also has to do with having his worldview and understanding his purpose in, in this world. When we begin to think like he thinks, to see like he sees, to grieve like he grieves, and, and to rejoice like he rejoices. Communion with him affects our emotions when we, when we hate sin like he hates sin. And when we sorrow all over lost people like he sorrows over lost people. The Bible says Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and he, he had great sorrow. He wept over Jerusalem. Do we have that kind of heart? That's part of our communion with him when we begin to live like he lived and, and, and feel like he lived. Through our actions, we have communion with him. When Jesus lives to restore people to a relationship with God the Father, do we live? When we begin to live in that kind of a, 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 a lifestyle that, that we, we just look to see people come back into relationship with God, that's communion with him. When we live to deny ourselves to honor someone else, when we are generous in, our, in, in the way we help the downtrodden, or when we uh, make peace with, uh, in, in a situation where there's turmoil, when we cooperate with Jesus in his actions, is to live in a, a life of communion with him. And he wants us to, to do that with him. That builds our relationship with him, but he also wants it to be in the way we relate with one another, in our conversation with each other. Do we encourage one another? Do we call each other up and say, hey, I, just, I, was, I was thinking about you. I was praying for you. How are you doing? Uh, when we uh, maybe just... Somebody comes to mind out of the clear blue sky and, and, and we just take a moment and say, Lord, just bless Mike, bless John, bless. Just, I don't know what they need right now, but I just, just want you to, to bless them. That's walking in communion. When we help each other, we see somebody has a need and we reach out with a helping hand. We are, after all, we are blood brothers and sisters. We all are sons and daughters of the same father. We are in relationship, whether you like it or not. You know, sometimes brothers and sisters would just as soon not have the, that brother or sister. But you're stuck. You're stuck with me because we have the same blood flowing in us, the blood of Christ. And so uh, we are blood brothers and, and blood sisters. We're washed in one blood. We're fed by the same loaf of bread. We're cheered by the same cup. All of our differences fade away. And we being many are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. That's why when we come together in the body of Christ, we, we find encouragement from one another. So today, as we partake of communion together, let's remember it goes beyond this act, but as we do it here, we come, three things I want to suggest that we should do that, that his word suggests we do. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says that we should look back. When we, when we come to the communion table, we should look back in remembrance of Christ. Communion speaks of intimacy and fellowship. And so we look back. We look back to the cross. We look back to what Christ has accomplished 
for us. And we are reminded of his love for us as we look back. But then we also don't just look back, but we also look forward. Because he, he tells us that we're supposed to do this until he comes again. And so we look forward to the, uh, his coming again. You know, the first time Jesus came to earth, he came as a suffering servant. He gave his life for us. The next time he will come as a conquering king. And so communion is an observance not only of what he's done, but it's also a looking forward to what he is yet to do. And so we look back and we look forward. One other thing we need to look at, we need to look inward. We're to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, he said. Look at ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to show us any areas in our lives that may not be pleasing to him. Any, any areas in our life that we need to make right before him. And as we acknowledge these areas, Christ stands with his arms wide open saying, come. Come. There's forgiveness. There's restoration. There's healing. Because he stands ready for us to come.